I'm in it for the long haul. So I don't care how many people I've got to call out. I'm I'm brazen in a way. I'll I'll go on I'll go on anybody's channel. I'll go and call them out to the face. I'll go and call them out in any way that I need to, mm. because I am utterly committed to taking that message forward. <laughs> Hey, so welcome to another episode of the Carb Strong Cast, and I have a special guest here today, Dr. Michelle Lowe. Now, this she is a psychologist and a vegan YouTuber. First come across Michelle, um, she was doing some response videos to carnivores on YouTube, and then I saw her do a live stream with Vegan Gains after her uh, debate that she had. So, thank you for coming in. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I feel and very honoured to be here. I know you come a long way, so it's really cool to have you here in the Carb Strong HQ. Um, <laughs> So first of all, for people that don't know who you are, can you give like a little outline of what what you do, where you, where you come from, what, what you do for your career? Yeah. So I'm a chartered psychologist. That's what I do for my day job. I teach psychology, um, mainly forensic and social psychology. Um, I also teach research methods and statistics. So I feel when I do critique um, people who... Uh, make onerous judgments about statistics that I do know what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, I've been a PhD since 2002 and my PhD was in social psychology and I see a lot of uh, ways in which social psychology can be applied to vegan activism. Okay. So that's what I'm starting to do now on my channel. I'm in introducing more and more psychology into my channel. So my channel is very broad, like I do, I do fun stuff, I do taste tests. I do response videos, but I also want to I want to encourage people to understand how activism actually works yeah. in the mind and how it how persuasion techniques. I've got a video coming out very soon on the social psychology of persuasion and what vegan activists need to know about persuasion. So um, yeah, I've got a lot of good plans for my channel. Definitely. Wow, we can get into all of that stuff because that sounds super interesting. I think this is going to be a great podcast. How did you go from a psychologist to a vegan on YouTube? How was that transition? Okay, well, I've been a vegetarian since I was 11 years old. Wow. At the age of 11, me and my friend, we loved animals and we couldn't understand why we ate animals and no one, no one seemed to bat an eyelid about it. Mm -hmm. She lasted four weeks before she fell for the dramas that her family put forward to her. But I'm still here. Wow. I, haven't, I haven't eaten meat or fish since I was 11. Wow. Um, as an older teenager, I did veganism for four and a half years, but I was too young, too immature. I used to cheat, and I kind of see myself in some of the younger cheating vegans yeah. <laughs> um, that are on YouTube today. And I probably, if I had, you know, if I was that age now, I may have even been one of those. Um, but I stayed vegetarian. I, I, I dropped off veganism after about four and a half years. Didn't like eggs, really. So it was just dairy. It's only dairy that has been the thing that was my downfall. Okay. Um, and I was in complete denial. Complete denial. I knew, I knew what cows and their calves went through. But I was in denial and I allowed myself to be in denial until the beginning of 2016 when one of my co-workers, who was new at the time, she's vegan, and she just had a chat with me and it was a chat over a cheese sandwich. And she said, oh, you're vegetarian. And she was totally non-confrontational. Um, another psychologist. Okay. <laughs> and she said, um, you know, vegetarianism's great and you're saving animals. However, do you know about the dairy industry? And I said, I do. And it hit me. I went away and it hit me like a, like a light bulb came on. And I thought, I've been in denial for years and years. Drinking milk, eating cheese, eating chocolate, and thinking, oh, it's only a few things. I don't have it every day. That kind of thing, you know. Wow. And, um, and so I, I, I started to transition. I ate the food that I already had in my house. Um, and because I don't like waste, and I transitioned into veganism. So I've been a vegan now, completely vegan, for three and a half years. So um, I wanted to start a YouTube. I started a YouTube kind of early end of last year, 
And I was talking about veganism, um, but not seriously. I was just vlogging my life, just vlogging whatever I felt like it. Um, but I'd been watching vegan YouTube and I was commenting on vegan videos and, and I thought, you know what, I want to I wanna do this seriously. Mm -hmm. I want to do this as as an activist kind of move movement. And I think I've got a lot to offer, the mm -hmm. activism movement, um, in terms of the academic side. So slowly I've gained followers and I've found my feet. I've, you know, I've found people who are willing to listen to me. Um, I think that's in part because of the all the response videos I do to yeah, the carnists. Of course. Um, and I think that is important. I think they need calling out at every single opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they call that enough, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and the bullies, um, the, you know, the, uh, my comment section is plagued, plagued with trolls. Yeah. Um, but they spur me on. They absolutely spur me on because I know I'm making them, I'm, I'm making them think. They don't know it, but I'm making them think. Yeah. And the more they kick back, the more I know they're desperate. Yeah. And some of their arguments are just completely, insanely desperate. They are. Uh, Very crazy. illogical. There's not much logic Indeed. going on there in the uh, carnival movement, I feel. Um, you know, sometimes you have the people that are, you know, they're, they're just eating the, the standard diet of plants and yeah. meat. But then when you go to these con carnivals, they, they rely completely off anecdotal... Uh, just opinion yeah. and you don't there is no scientific evidence to back up any of their claims there but there seems to be a movement of these this information that's been repeated between them and they feel like that's evidence enough and mm. what is it about these uh you know carnivores that are just following someone's opinion or someone sounds good on camera so they're, so they're taking that over the mountains of scientific evidence that is out there i think there's several things going on there um firstly at the more simple level people like to be told good things about their bad habits. Yeah. Um, you know, if uh, if some, uh, you know, a, a newspaper article comes out saying, oh, smoking isn't so bad, you get the smokers who say, yeah, I'm not doing anything too bad to my body. So it's easy. It's easy to have a situation where if, you, if you're told good things about bad habits, you are going to believe them. You might not really believe them. You want to believe them. You want to believe them, yeah. exactly. You Thank want you. To believe I'll them. take that. Yeah, I'll take that one. Yep. Um, but on a, on a deeper level, I think what I've seen is those, those carnivores and those that are close to carnivore, what they're doing is science denying. And I think there's a, a deeper, almost like a societal issue, that people feel that scientists lie to them, that everybody's in it together, the government's in it with the scientist, and the scientists are funded by big, 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 big and... farmer, big, big broccoli. <laughs> I got you. And, and, and I think people fall into, like, like the Flat Earth Movement, for example, people have fallen into that because they want to they want to feel that they're they're not falling for the the mainstream lines about science yeah there's being um you know discerning and but not throwing the baby out with the bathwater exactly. like just because there's a there is corruption in a certain you know institution mm. doesn't mean the whole institute is corrupt and they account for this bias in in research don't they they, they, do. they peer review it yeah. they make sure it's legitimate yeah um there is ways around that though maybe like certain studies can be designed in a way that they favor a certain outcome. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean all science is then null and void, <laughs> you know, deny all evidence and work off. What, what, yeah. what evidence do they work off? Well, when I had a, the, the debate with uh, Bart Kay a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. that was what I wanted to get through to him. Um, he feels that I lied to him and I got on, got on his channel under false pretenses, but he can think that if he likes. But I started off wanting to talk about the some new research that had come out in the annals of internal medicine, saying that meat is actually quite good for us and there's no evidence to suggest meat is bad. Um, and it's not true. I read those papers and they're not saying anything new. They're not saying anything novel. So I started off with, you know, I wanted to get Bart's opinion on that. Um, but what I really wanted to do was get him to admit on camera in front of me that he has no evidence because he's, you know, he's bullying people, he's accruing followers mm -hmm. under false pretenses, and he'll probably try to sue me for slander for saying that, but he is. And he said, there's no evidence. There's no evidence that meat is good. There's no evidence 
for any nutritional. Nutritional science, throw it out. Throw it out of the water. So you're saying there's no evidence on either side? On either side, there's no evidence. So I said, well, why then are you, you know, supporting a carnivore diet? And he said, well, we've got anecdotes. We've got... <laughs> a- anecdotes. We're collecting explain anecdotes. What an, explain what an anecdote is for someone who's listening who might not... An anecdote is the equivalent of a story. Mm-hmm. So normally, if you look at the dictionary definition of anecdote... It's an amusing story. Mm-hmm. So the difference between an anecdote and science is it's the difference between collecting data under controlled conditions from thousands of people and potentially carrying that study on in a longitudinal fashion for many years so yeah. you can get like you can track people's health outcomes mm-hmm. and asking someone on the train how they're feeling. Yeah. That's the difference between an anecdote and saying, you know, oh, yeah, I feel like this today. And a scientific study that has got thousands of people, thousands and thousands of data points and statistics to, and it's been peer reviewed and published in mm-hmm. prestigious journals yeah. are supporting the you know, plant based lifestyle. So. so that's the best avail- available evidence we have on nutrition is these big population big studies. studies yeah. So they're like a cohort study where they, yeah. they either go backwards in time and track yeah. people or they follow they them. Follow them. Yeah. Because um, a lot of people might not understand research and how it's collected and how statistics are collected and how you know they find these differences in health outcomes. Yeah. Can you explain like what a cohort is and how, like let's just say um, the Adventist study, how they would mm. do something like that? Okay. So what they might do is take a cohort, so a, a, a group of people, a large group of people, And they might want to, let's say, for example, look at colon cancer as one of their potential outcomes. So at baseline, they'll take a lot of data. So they'll they'll get medical evidence from records. So they'll make sure that nobody at baseline has got colon cancer. Okay. They'll take measures to do with the current diet and things like that. So that's one of the criticisms of these cohort studies, that some of them have only looked at what diet people are on once. And then once they start following them for years, well, people might change their diet. So that's an obvious criticism. But there are some studies that have actually consistently, consistently um, tested diet and mm-hmm. got people to do not just one, a one questionnaire, but food diaries and things like that. So, no, it's not perfect, but it's the best we can do yeah. whilst being ethical. What and do you mean by that being ethical? Because being you ethical. can't lock people in the exactly. room and do a... Exactly. Yeah, do exactly. like an RCT... <laughs> Exactly. You can't take people out of their everyday life, say, right, you guys don't have colon cancer. You guys don't have colon cancer either. So we're going, now going to lock you up for 10 years. And give and, one of you colon cancer but through diet. And we're going to force feed <laughs> mm. um, half of you a carnivore diet yep. and force feed half of you a plant-based diet. Mm. Well, you can't do that. It's unethical. So, so the next best thing is to track people through their daily lives take measures of what they're eating mm-hmm. and um, th- th- other th- they also take into account things like alcohol use, smoking. Exercise. And- exercise, yeah. Um, other other health poss- possibilities. Social that- sort of setting or... Didn't Sometimes. The, didn't the Aventus study account for the most variables? Uh, well, it, a it, lot. Was, it was a very comprehensive study, mm-hmm. yeah. So the more comprehensive a study is, the more well planned it is, the more variables that you can account for throughout the entire study, yeah. then the less limitations that study has. Okay. So there's no one perfect study. Every single study that's ever been published in any field whatsoever, not just nutrition or psychology or biology, but physics and chemistry, all of it, there's always going to be limitations. And that's why when authors write up papers, they always have a section in the discussion addressing the limitations okay. and then suggesting uh, future ideas for research, how, how such limitations might be overcome in the future. Okay. So in terms of cohort studies, what if it was just one, one cohort study that had ever been done and that was it, mm-hmm. on one population, one sample, say the Adventist study, and they'd collected it you know, over a few years and it was just one, I wouldn't be convinced by it. The thing that convinces me is although these studies have their limitations, what they are doing is collecting data from many different parts of the world different types of people asking different types of questions 
using using statistical methods that are the most robust that they possibly can be. So taking taking into account lots of uh, possible confounding variables. Yes. And the data comes together as a consistent body of research. The other thing about scientific research is that um, if you, you find what we call converging lines of evidence, mm -hmm. so we've got the cohort studies like the epidemiological uh, data, data sets, but we've also got more mechanistic data. We've also got, however cruel they might be, we've also got animal studies. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can look at models of how things might, might be playing out in the body. Yeah, mechanistic data, just explain mechanistic to people. Mechanistic data is how something works. Yeah. So because you can't you can't look inside the body, you can't look inside the body, what you've kind of got to do is, again, it's about compromise mm -hmm. because you can't rip people open to no. look at their insight. It's unethical to do that. So there's other ways you can do it. You can do in vitro studies, which are in the test tube. You can, you can develop animal models and look, at, uh, and look at animals. But mechanistic data is just how something works and tracking, like putting together a model. Sometimes it's theoretical because sometimes you don't have all the evidence. But you, like, like, for example, the role of cholesterol in atherosclerosis. Yes. Um, that's a, a big thing that the, the carnists are denying at the moment. And they say that, you know, we, we should only look at the mechanistic data. But we know how atherosclerosis develops. And we know that LDL has got a role in that development. It's not the sole cause, but we know from converging lines of evidence through many years of different studies... Yeah. So how can that be denied? So the can, overall, in terms of nutrition, what, we, what we've got at the moment, and we can pick studies apart, we can look at the different flaws in individual studies, but because we've got, we've got replicative findings, we've got different populations, different locations, different time points, looking at a variety of different like illness outcomes, you know, cancer, heart disease, strokes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then we've got the mechanistic side. We have got some randomised control trials. They tend to be small scale. They tend to be again flawed, but putting the body of evidence together, all of it together, what we can say is, <laughs> eating meat is one of the worst things you can do. Wow. For your health. So you're saying all of these collectively are pointing to the same thing. They're collecting. So they're all they, supporting yeah. part, bits of data. Yeah. And then they do something like it's a, a meta-analysis where they analyze a group of a large group of yeah. like a few hundred studies yeah. and yeah. see if there's anything consistent. Yeah. So what they do in meta-analysis is they they start off with what we call a systematic review of the literature. Okay. So they they, they might want to look at all the different studies that have been um, done on colon cancer and meat, for example, mm -hmm. right? So they systematically review the literature, they make sure they don't miss anything. And then if they have um, enough studies that have used broadly the same measures, then they can do a meta-analysis. So as well as the systematic review, which is a systematic review of the literature, mm -hmm. they do a meta-analysis, which is a statistical technique which looks at the magnitude of the effect overall. So it pulls the data from all of those different studies and it looks at the effect sizes and how strong the effects are. So meta-analyses are, are considered the pinnacle of the hierarchy of evidence, the scientific hierarchy of evidence. Again, the hierarchy is something that the carnists deny. And I've, I've done a video on the, the hierarchy of evidence and I, I'll readily admit that just because it's a meta-analysis doesn't mean it's good. Okay. Because there are some terrible meta-analyses out there. Um, it might be that the research area doesn't lend itself terribly well to meta-analyses because the, the measures aren't really very consistent. Would, would you say that the worst meta-analysis is better than the best anecdote in terms of evidence? Oh, without, without <laughs> a shadow of a doubt. Uh, the, the anecdotes don't even make it on, on to the hierarchy of evidence because they're not science. They're just not science. No. They're, they're just having a conversation. You could say anything and exactly. that would be considered evidence. Exactly. And this is what I said in the Bart Cady debate. I said, well, all right then, if you're collecting anecdotes, I could go along and collect anecdotes from a hundred of my friends who happen to be vegan and they'll all 
say veganism's great you know my health has improved i feel so much better and he went yeah you could do so mm. uh, okay. but <sighs> it sounds like someone's they're very fixed in their belief system and don't want to accept the other way or they they they're, they're really fixed in it and denying evidence and putting their blinders on and not yeah, yeah. so yeah. that that's really interesting um Let's talk about the psychology of social change yeah. um, and how activism actually works. Because you do get people that, you know, the, the three stages of truth. Mm. First, it's ridiculed, yeah, violently yeah, opposed, yeah. and then it's accepted. Yeah. So I get people, you know, getting angry. And, you know, mm. I've been an activist now and just felt the repercussions of saying something people don't want to hear. It's usually yeah. something uncomfortable that they feel is true yeah. at some level. And, it, and they have all different types of reactions. They might ignore her. I don't, the ones that ignore her, I don't even feel are close to ready to change. Yeah. But what is it about activism techniques that creates this stir in society and causes this change? Well, there's, there's, there's many th ways we could look at this in social psychology. Mm -hmm. um, the, the anger that you might be confronted with when you tell someone an uncomfortable truth, it's, it's possible that once that anger dissipates, you can have, that person can have what we call the sleeper effect happen to them. So when you are confronted with a... Um, a, a new truth, a new, a new revelation, something that you I haven't looked at it that way before. And it might be a persuasion technique, it might be someone trying to sell you something, it might, it might be uh, a political uh, movement, and you, you go away and you think about it. But normally, that potential for change that they might have once their anger dissipates, normally it dissipates over time unless it's prompted again. But actually, the sleeper effect in social psychology is really interesting because instead of the potential for attitude change dissipating over time, the sleeper effect makes it stronger. It makes them more likely to change. And the thing that instigates the sleeper effect is discounting information. So if somebody gets angry because maybe they're in a group of people and they don't want to feel embarrassed. They're out on the street and they don't want to feel embarrassed. That, they count that as discounting information. So they're discounting what you're telling them because it's too uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's too uncomfortable for them to even confront what they're doing. Okay. Right. So it's the equivalent of me, although I wasn't angry about it, but it's the equivalent of me denying what I knew about cows and calves when I was, th through those years, drinking milk mm -hmm. and eating cheese. Right, that denial was there, but it was so deep seated, and nobody confronted me on it. That's the thing; no one ever confronted me on it. If they had, then maybe I would have felt some anger, and I would have felt some resistance. But yeah, I think the sleep effect would have kicked in, because all of that discounting information that I could drum up in my head, I know it's not real. I know it's not true. So the force for change, the, the, that resistance dissipates over time and the potential for attitude change gets stronger over time. So I think with activism, the in-your-face confronting people, I think although it doesn't, I mean, it might do sometimes, but it doesn't instantly get people to say, yeah, I'm going vegan, I'm going vegan right now. What it does is it gives them the food for thought. Yeah. And once a movement starts to take hold then it's like exponentially and i think we're beginning to see this now with mm. the vegan movement and we can thank um we can thank the big businesses we mm. can thank the big companies mm. for putting veganism into the media yeah you know like the mcdonald's new burgers and things like that i mean greg's the, the, sausage rolls yeah, and pierce greg's morgan sausage rolls. bad exactly. media for veganism but it's actually helped into the discussion exactly mm. exactly that uh, you know these things are dreadful they're not they're no more healthy than junk food that's got meat in it really mm -hmm. um yeah, a little bit but maybe um but if you couldn't live on mcdonald's vegan burgers and greg sausage rolls but as a treat to show people that actually you can have some treats actually you can go out with your friends actually you know veganism is not this hippy dippy 
nonsense, you know, uh, like people wearing flowers in their hair or anything it's like that. It's normalising it. It's just mm. every, anybody can be vegan. Yeah. So it doesn't matter whether you're fat, thin, it doesn't matter whether you're a bodybuilder or you're a, a school teacher or you're a, a, a family-oriented person. It doesn't matter who you are or how old you are or where you come from. There is a way to be vegan. And if you want to go down the junk food vegan route, then do it. Because the chances are you're probably living on a junk food diet anyway. Yeah. And it doesn't, that doesn't matter. What we want people to do is, is stop killing animals. Mm. So to, to show people all of the potential, I think the media is helping us. And that Ferrari that happens every now and again with people at Piers Morgan, what they're doing is adding discounting information into the argument. And remember what I said about discounting information. Actually, it makes attitude change stronger over time. Wow. So that, again, it's about converging, converging lines of evidence that if you're confronted with someone who, who might be in your face on the street or they might be like my coworker who just had a word with me, who just talked to me about, you know, have you thought about the dairy industry? Have you? And it's like, yeah, I have, yeah, yeah, I have. And then I went back to my office and I was like, mm. and that was it, right? So it could be something like a light bulb moment, but for most people who've never considered veganism, and you've got to remember I was a vegetarian since I was 11, yeah. um, somebody who's never considered veganism might take a long time it's going to be a process exactly a lot it of conditioning a there and, yeah exactly because you've got a lifetime like like we've all had a lifetime mm. of not even not even equating kids are not told that that lamb on their plate is the lamb that two weeks ago was was in a field or in a in a shed or it was alive it was a living sentient creature mm -hmm. and it's even called the same yeah <laughs> you know and uh People just don't make that connection. And I think once they do make that connection, then it can be a long process of having to admit to themselves that they need to change. And it's because of the conditioning, because of the taste pleasure that people have been conditioned to get from meat, from dairy, from egg products, and then all of the derivatives, you know, there's, there's so many foods out there that have got egg, egg powder in and yeah. milk powder in and things like that. So you think, oh, well, to be vegan, I've got to, I've got to check packets and I've got to do this and I've got to do that. Inconvenience. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you can say, actually, yes, you do, you do have to check packets, but you very quickly learn what things are vegan when you're shopping, what things are vegan and what, what isn't. Yeah. And it's only newer products or things you've never had before that you need to check. Yeah, you build a habit over time, and it's exactly. kind of fun at the start, like exactly. finding what, exactly. you know all these cool things you can, can yeah. eat. And so, like, I got over the vegan junk food sort of thing at the start. Yeah. I still promote them because it's I believe it's good for animals to let people know yeah, that exactly. these exist. Yeah. But at the start, I was like, oh my god, this and this <laughs> and this. Uh, now I, I eat predominantly whole foods vegan. Yeah. I try to keep my health under wraps because long term, I think oh, predominantly definitely. a whole foods plant based diet. And I check my nutrients. I mean, I'm not yeah. th that rigorous. I, it's really easy to collect a bunch of different minerals and vitamins when you're eating whole plant foods. I mean, exactly. So exactly. that's interesting. So. Um, like, let's just look at other social justice movements. And there was a bit of anger when these first started. Hey, and like they were doing a lot of direct action stuff, which was getting people talking and getting people angry. And, mm. and you know, maybe even that people in their own movement were saying, oh, that's too extreme. That's too extreme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been called an extremist, a terrorist, militant, um, you name it. I've been called it. Um, uh, so a couple of years ago, about January 2018, I did a tour around the UK and it just, there was a lot of media attention. I yeah. did a few... In the paper all the time for using words like rape and you yeah, know, yeah. and murder and yeah. all of these things and um, you're, what you're saying is initially it might look on the surface yeah. like people are angry and this isn't working but yeah. fundamentally we're getting the conversation started and exactly. it's causing this effect to start exactly and and I think we've gone we've gone a little bit beyond getting the conversation to start now yeah I think we've done that yeah and I think now we need to just keep up the momentum okay. And um, yeah, absolutely. You know, the direct action, getting getting into the media because you've called something murder. You know, that's great, and that needs to carry on um, because it keeps the media interested and it keeps the opposers interested. It keeps them coming back with the counter argument because the counter arguments actually work in our favour. 
not only for the sleeper effect, but because every single one of those counter arguments can be countered. Can yeah. be, because there, there is so much evidence, there is so much evidence, not just on health, not just in science, but ethically, you know, you cannot deny that the farming industries in the Western world are horrific. Horrific. Absolutely horrific, the, and you cannot deny the, that. These, the, the ones who talk about uh, eating carnivore for health, they don't really want to talk about ethics as much. Yeah, exactly. But when they do, um, I've noticed they use crop deaths. Um, you can't cause mm. no harm, yeah. so you might as well, you know, like <laughs> basically everything has a cost. Uh, everything causes some amount of harm. Your existence yeah. causes some amount of harm. So there's no distinction between stabbing a cow and buying a table to do this podcast with. Yeah. How do you tackle the, you can't cause no harm, sort of, it's kind of like the appeal to... Futility. Futility, yeah. yeah. How do you handle that? I, I've talked a lot about crop death on my channel because mm -hmm. it's one of the main things that the carnists come back with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on videos, in my comment section, it's constant. So I've made quite a lot of videos about it. And the thing I say is there is, there is no such thing as harm-free living. So if you buy a new computer, a new camera, a new microphone, all of these things we have in the Western world have been made in a sweatshop somewhere. And we can do things to minimize our use. So, you know, just to, um, you know, buy secondhand. And there's lots of things you can do if you're concerned about that kind of um, human rights issue. Mm -hmm. But you cannot live unless you live in a, a cave in somewhere and you can't not make any harm right. at all. So in terms of crop deaths and veganism, I think as a psychologist, I think the best way to deal with that is to admit, yes, absolutely, harvesting kills insects. It ruins the habitat, at mm -hmm. least for you know, a period of time. For mice, you know, harvest mice who are nests might get destroyed. Mm -hmm. The mice might be able to run away, a lot of them might be able to run away, but there might be babies in nests that get killed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, we can acknowledge that. Yeah. But as vegans, what we should be appealing to the farming industry to do is to make farming more ethical. So there's the veganic farming movement, for yeah. example. So if these carnists are concerned about crop deaths, well, why aren't they f joining us to appeal to farmers to produce more ethical plant foods? So you can make the <laughs> plant farming uh, more ethical. Exactly. You can't really make slashing an animal's throat and breeding them more ethical, can you? Like Absolutely not. N yeah. And, and also, uh, in, in addition to appealing, you know, campaigning for more ethical plant farming... What do those animals eat? Plants. Those, <laughs> exactly. Magnitudes so, more crops than we do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the majority of the crops that are that are uh, grown in the Western world are for animal feed. What about grass-fed cattle? And then well, that's just grass-fed cattle and they've got these big blocks of like harvested grass and they feed it to them in a barn. And I'm like, <laughs> well... You harvested that grass off of a crop and you're feeding it to a cow, calling it grass fed. And they're exactly. eating it and they're like, I'm causing no harm to crop deaths. So, like I heard people just say they're killing that one cow. It's like, what did that cow eat? You think they, that there's free grazing cows in UK? <laughs> Where are these free grazing cows? They, they put them in a barn for six months or seven months. Exactly. Year. Exactly. So, you know, you've got the hay production, but also on a farm, you've got pest control. Yeah. So farmers will shoot rabbits, they'll shoot, they'll, they'll, they'll trap mice, they'll poison animals. In the UK, we've got the badger cull yeah. that happens every single year. And, and badgers are being killed by their thousands. For the dairy industry, is that something? For the, for the, the, the cow industry. Yeah, basically right? beefing, yeah. Because supposedly they spread bovine tuberculosis. But there's actually no evidence mm. that bovine tuberculosis has reduced in severity or incidences because of the badger call. There's actually a vaccination for bovine TB mm -hmm. that isn't being used. So the badgers, you know, what have badgers ever done to anyone? No. You know, no, it's they not, they're not even considered a pest, only to farmers. Just targeted. 
And so anything they can throw at a vegan for crop deaths, you can throw the magnitude of 100 back to exactly. them eating animal products. Exactly. We're trying to minimize our harm. And, um, but like, what if I were to call you a hypocrite for buying a microphone or something like that that has these minerals in it? How would you navigate that? I mean, are you a hypocrite? Uh, but they might, you know, I always, I'll get this argument a lot that like, you have an iPhone, iPhones contain these minerals from somewhere down the line. There might've been some exploitation yeah. for that mineral. Uh, but they're typing me this to me on their own iPhone exactly. <laughs> while they're eating a steak burger and exactly. I'm trying to do my best. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful mm. about what I, what I consume, mm-hmm. both in terms of, of not just food, but everything. Yeah. You know, I buy secondhand when I, when I can. But I've got tech, I've got an iPhone, I've got a MacBook, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think where there is acknowledgement, I think just kicking back and getting angry back at them is not productive. I think opening a dialogue is is the way to go. Mm-hmm. So you say, yes, it does. It contains that all the tech we have has, has had a, some kind of abuse connected to it. Probably. Possibly. There, there's no definitive, like with Apple put out this big statement about um, yeah, yeah, yeah. minerals that they, they, they were going to cut ties with the coal bat mining and yeah, yeah. You know, this slavery. Yeah. There might still be something in this phone that is yeah, questionable, yeah. right? Yeah, definitely. When we look at a steak, there's no question about that. Exactly. That, you know, exactly. So. It's, it's, about, it's about degrees of, um, of potential harm. So again, it's like campaigning for... Um, crop farming to become more ethical Mm. well consumers can campaign for tech companies to become more ethical which they did didn't remember they they suicide nets that they were exactly exactly so there is there is there's no excuse really for a company to continue unethical practices Mm -hmm. if it's very consumers want it to change so you know, it's, it's kind of like again, the plastic thing, right? Yeah, yeah. You want to buy vegan food to end the animal holocaust, but it's all wrapped in plastic exactly. and you want to help the, the oceans too. So that's the, where, where we go, hey, we love your vegan food. Yeah. Can you make this plastic yeah. like dissolvable, recyclable yeah. or something? Like, yeah, we're get, yeah. making steps here. Yeah. And it is. It's like you can't, you can't change society overnight. No. We can't make every single company completely ethical overnight. We can't change attitudes of farmers overnight, no. but we can do it step by step. Mm-hmm. And once that momentum starts, and it already has in the vegan movement, then we can draw people in. So draw the environmentalists in who are concerned about plastics and mm-hmm. climate change, mm-hmm. climate science. Again, undeniable, mm-hmm. the climate science. And absolutely undeniable that plastics are killing coral reefs, they're killing fish, they're killing seals. Undeniable. Again, it it takes somebody who is in a huge amount of denial to deny that those things are happening. And people do deny those things are happening, absolutely. But it's about drawing people in who are, maybe not be vegan, but they are our allies. And making kind of like a like a, a united front on certain issues. Mm-hmm. So supporting consumers who campaign for more ethical tech, mm-hmm. you know, offering, offering from a vegan, yes, I support this. This is not a vegan issue on its own. Very good point. Be- because once, once people, you know, think, right, f- to be a vegan, you've got to be the hippie that, and the hermit that lives in a cave. No, you can be a normal person. Because actually, yes, we, we can draw allies from different campaigns and we can help those campaigns by supporting them. But veganism is its own ethical movement. Exactly, yeah. Veganism is not about protecting workers in, in certain countries, although it's horrible, and, and the mineral mines, right, potential for abuse, absolutely, but it's a di- that's a different issue mm. than veganism. So why do they try to attach all these issues to the animal movement? Because, because it's, it's desperate ways to be able to... Appeal to hypocrisy? Exactly. <laughs> to be able to throw things back. Mm. Because they can't throw ethics back at us. They can try through crop deaths. I've never heard that anyone falls flat. with a <clears throat> I've never heard anyone with a compelling argument against the ethics of breeding millions and millions of animals and stabbing them to death for a burger that we don't need for our survival. And that's where the carnivores either 
one of two things. They either say, I'm not interested in ethics. I'm only interested in my health. I don't care how many animals I have to kill because I'm living my best life eating steak. So that's, some people do that and you think, mm, they're, they're pretty much a lot. That doesn't cause. appeal to popularity though. <laughs> it, 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 so definitely it doesn't, doesn't appeal to the majority. So they're kind of doing uh, advocacy inadvertently for us by saying absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the carnivore, carnivore movement are acting as advocates. Because like a radical they opposition. So, <laughs> they are so ridiculous <laughs> on many different levels. Yeah. They are. They are. They solidify our, our argument. Makers. They do. People can make their own mind. They up do. Yeah. They do. And um, the other thing they they say is, yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. Factory farming's horrendous, and um, but I only buy grass fed. Yeah. It's like yeah, but that grass fed animal still died so that you could have your steak. Yeah, but it had a good life. Did it? Did it have a good life? You know, and and it's like, well, do you just live on steak? And there are so few people who literally just live on steak. Yeah. You know, maybe Sean Baker and Jordan and Michaela Peterson. Those are the only, only people that I know live on beef. Mm. Everybody else, the carnivores, they live on a wider variety of... They're just looking for an excuse to foods. eat that meat. It's just an excuse. <laughs> but, yeah. It's an excuse. Mm. And as the carnivore movement has grown a little bit in popularity on YouTube, then you've got people who are, um, like Frank Tofano, for example, he's on like 60-odd thousand subs now. You know, he's seen, he's seen his channel grow over the last year and year and a half massively. Because people are having a look at what this carny movement's all about. And they're like, oh, well, here it is, my yeah, excuse not to give my, my steak excuse. away. Oh, thanks, Frank. Exactly. Give that one a like. I'm not going vegan. Thanks, Frank. Exactly. No science. Don't need excuse. it. Just need you to tell me it's yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But remember that, you know, opposing arguments are good. Yeah. Opposing arguments keep the conversation going, whether that's in the media, whether it's on social media. I invite opposing arguments into my comments. I don't, I don't ban them unless they're incredibly abusive because what, what we're doing in my comment section is putting those, all of those arguments forward time and time and time again. And then if there's certain things that I'll make a video on, you know, just to make sure people are listening to it, mm. and that's how I'm inching forward with my channel. Wow. Um, so that, you have a strategy behind yeah, what yeah, you're yeah. doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. I have a strategy, yeah. Um, I didn't start off with a strategy, but it's developed of the, the last few months in introducing psychology, psychology videos. That's one element of, of putting out there that actually psychology has a lot to say as, as, a, as a lot of advocacy in psychology mm. um, that, that, that can be used. Um, <clears throat> but also in taking issues that, are, that come up, such as crop deaths, such as grass fed, and, and addressing them head on and calling them out. So yeah, I do some response videos that are a little bit silly, but it's just to draw an audience in. Yeah. Because once the audience are there and the audience are watching, then they can they they they're more likely then to view the more serious stuff that will make them think. So it's, that's it, my strategy. It's actually one of the best strategies because you're mm. draw, you're drawing in the opposite yeah. uh, audience and exactly. you, you're persuading them over. But, but, exactly. Uh, I think that's a very clever way to get your channel off the ground as well. Mm. Is target bigger channels that you have an opposing view to. Yeah. Bring their followers over to you. You discuss your end of it, and yeah, yeah. it brings you up in the search. Uh, so it that's does, how yeah. I found your channel as well. Yeah. And I actually found you originally, I think, from Vegan Foot Soldier. He mentioned you. And then yeah. he said he'd been watching a lot of your vegan videos, and I was like, "Oh, really?" And then I went and had a look, and I was like, "Oh, wow!" And yeah, then Vegan Gains had you on his channel for the live stream, and what you said about research was just impeccable. Like the mm. way you said it, it's just like, "Well, you're just denying this solid evidence exactly. and, that we have." Um, so let's talk about like what would your advice be, like as a psychologist, um, to vegan activists out there who uh, they've all found their way that that resonates with them. Yeah. Like what would your advice be to them? Like in terms of being effective, like say in conversations or let's just, if mm. we can make it broad and then specific or. I think broadly, I think good activism takes many forms. Yeah. That not everybody has the confidence to go, be able to go out in the street and confront people. Mm -hmm. So they think, I can't be a vegan activist because, you know, I'm socially anxious, I'm shy, and, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know what to do if someone got angry. Yeah. Well, leave that. Leave that form of activist activism to the people who are good at it. Yeah. Because there are many different ways to be an activist. So I've chosen to use my academic skills into activism. So I'm not saying I'd never go out on the street. 
and and you know and, and do that thing um but day on day my daily life lends itself and my my level of expertise lends itself to activism via social media in a, a persuasive psychological broad strategic way that's activism it's drawing people in it's asking it's getting people to ask questions if nothing else but in terms of advice for activists i think the on the back of that i think your activism is best served doing what you're good at because that's where you sit best that's where you're the most confident that's where your arguments will come naturally and um you know you won't feel like you're out on the street like a, a you know shaking in your boots in case somebody gets angry that that doesn't, I mean, it's, it's great to have a try, but that's not great activism. But what you might be good at is something else. Yeah. So, so my advice would be, in a, in a broad sense, would be to, um, to do the type of activism that suits you as a person, fits with your life that you're the most confident with. More specifically, I'd give advice to activists by saying, don't be despondent, um, keep going. Because it's very, very easy to be put off by the what seems like reams of trolls. Yeah. But let that frustration that you feel, let that be the thing that spurs you on. Because mm. ultimately, those people are angry and they're shouty and they're ridiculous because they know we are right. Mm. They know we're right yeah. and they just can't admit it. So um, don't be despondent. Keep going. Keep going with your message. And um, and embrace other allied movements as well, and talk to those people too, mm. and and give the vegan message as broad a platform as possible. Yeah, I agree with that. Like, what do you think about the uh, co collaboration with uh, vegan animal rights activists with the climate movement with the Extinction Rebellion? Then we had the Animal Rebellion. I think that mm. was a good move. I think it, I think it is a good move. Um, again, it's you know it creates anger. It creates people, um, you know, being um, confrontational in, a, in an oppositional way. Yeah. But it keeps them in the news. Yeah. And, and having that, having that uh, media interest is, is the impetus that will, keep, will, will, that will keep veganism and environmentalism in the forefront of people's minds. Mm. And if people can think of one and not the other, that's okay. You know, they might be interested in environmentalism, but still not want to go vegan. Yeah. But it's still, it's a, it's a foot in the door. It's oh, what yeah. social psychologists call the foot in the door technique. It's getting someone to think about something small. You've got a real bigger motive, but you think of something small. Get them comfortable with that and then inch forward. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a movement that, that is, it's a progressive mm. step by step rarely a light bulb moment movement mm. but it's something that we have control of because we have everything in our favor we have the science the research from different areas nutrition environmentalism we have absolutely ethics on our side Undeniable. we have we mm. have what is right on our side mm. and if you think about it what is it 100 years ago that in the uk um bull baiting was legal dog fighting was legal cock fighting was legal those things are considered absolutely abhorrent today mm -hmm. you know yeah they happen you know in underground you know dens of iniquity but the general population thinks they're abhorrent mm -hmm. so something had to change at that point so we're now progressing on to well, actually, if you think that dog fighting's wrong because it cuts dogs' throats and it makes them, you know, it gives them a horrible life and they're in pain and eventually they die, well, what's the difference between a dog being in pain and eventually dying, bleeding out, and a pig, which has got an equal level of intelligence? Why? What, what's, what's the difference? So, what's the so difference? what role... Obviously, we're going into speciesism here, which is yeah, really yeah, interesting psychology mm. here. Um you got much more of a chance to convince someone that stabbing a dog to death is wrong than you do with a pig or a chicken yeah. or a fish. It's even further down oh, the spectrum yeah, yeah. trying to get someone to connect with a fish. Yeah. What role 
does speciesism play as a hindrance to the movement and how can we use it in our favour? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it, it is a, a hindrance because it's down to social conditioning. Mm-hmm. That, you know, nobody remembers a hundred and odd years ago when dog fighting was perfectly legal mm-hmm. and people were breeding dogs just to fight them. Mm-hmm. You know, so we grow up in a society where some animals are our friends and our pets and we can dress them up in silly costumes. Some of them are, you know, just out there in the wild and we can choose to leave them alone if, they, if we want to. And then we've got those few species that we eat. So in that way, it's a hindrance. But... Also, I think it's potentially a good thing that we can use the speciesism argument just as we can use any other argument, Mm -hmm. that it's a dialogue. It gets people talking Mm -hmm. Um, and it, you know, it, 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 it makes people think anything at all that makes people think is a good thing. And that's why, you know, activists shouldn't be despondent when when, you know, they say, well, you know, a pig, it's bread for my food and I like bacon. Bacon, though. Mm-hmm. And, but they're not, it's not the same as a dog. And then you can say, well, in China, dog meat is considered just like we think of pig meat, right? Mm-hmm. Chinese eat dogs. Oh, yeah, but that's disgusting. Why? You know, and they <laughs> might come out with some kind of racist comment. But, you know, it's, it's social conditioning. Mm-hmm. And social conditioning is, um, is, is a thing that will only change slowly. Okay. Really? Always? Uh, well, not always. Not always. Okay. Because um, if you have, if you have official channels on your side, okay, I think then social conditioning changes quicker. Mm. And potentially, we have that potential with the BBC reporting on the climate and all yeah. those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Guardian, like yeah, prestigious, yeah. they're credible sources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, we have that potential. I don't think we're quite there yet to get big change fast. I think we're still in the impetus building stage. Well, we've got a lot. Started. We've got a lot against us, don't we? Have exactly. industry against us. Exactly. We have like, financial ties. We have the government. They're all eating meat as well. So we have exactly. to change them at the top as well. Exactly. And so I think we've got. This is like a really big type. They're not human beings as well. These yeah, aren't yeah. human beings. Um, they're pigs as well. Yeah. They're not dogs. Yeah. yeah. So like. Um, what do you think about like, so the other movements of justice to do with women's rights and gay rights and, um, you know, the abolishment of slavery, Mm. these are all human issues. Now we've got human beings fighting for animals that people are just discriminate against. Obviously they've always been food. Do you think this is a huge barrier to, do you think this is going to slow down this change even further? What, that they're animals? That they're, not... They're, we're not fighting, this movement isn't fighting for other humans. It's We're fighting for another species now. And like it's and not just any species, not elephants. So we're talking about chickens. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, yes and no. It's it's a similar kind of thing to, to the speciesism argument. Yeah. That initially, you can kind of say, well, uh, human rights comes first. So any human rights movement comes first. But... No, because, you know, you might, you might have not even thought that actually at one time, you know, women were dying to get the vote. Yeah. We don't remember that. It's not part of our kind of social memory. And unless you're gay or you have gay friends or gay family members, the gay rights movement can just kind of almost like pass you by. Mm. You know, you can choose to say, oh, I don't care what people do. Or, or, or identify as, or, or I do care. You know, you can choose whether or not to to impart your time and resources into thinking about it. But with with meat, with veganism, it's everybody's issue. Uh-huh. Because, what, 90-odd percent of the population in every country in the Western world eats animal products consumes animals so it's everybody's issue i get it so it's not just about a human versus an animal issue it's it's an in your face issue so it's all the more reason for people to get angry to become a little bit conversant in the way that they can justify their denial because it's there every single day. And they have a very intimate connection with it. They're putting exactly. it in their mouth. They're chewing it up. It's passing through exactly. their body. 
So if you make them disgusted with that piece of flesh, exactly. you know they're going to be like, I'm, you're going to. I used to be afraid to see slaughterhouse footage because it would spoil my dinner, you know. And this is what people. I, I'm not going to change my whole lifestyle because you showed me the truth, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, and and again, that's why that different ways to engage people is really really important. That showing people slaughterhouse footage is incredibly powerful. Yeah. Because there is absolutely no way. The, 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 the only thing you can do confronted with slaughterhouse footage is to wince and to, you know, to just become, you know, like, like just stressed. Would you say it's the most powerful way to get this, the ethical issue into someone's consciousness by showing them exactly what goes on? With, without a doubt. However, there, there may be a caveat to that, that um, if you... If you are showing them slaughterhouse footage and they are one of those people who will just say, I don't care, mm. you're never going to change that. You've got to, you've got to you know, acknowledge that there are some people who will never change. No, and yeah. Whatever. They can, they can do what they want. Yeah. But, but there are many more people who, when confronted with the realities of the farming industry and the slaughter industry... They, it might take them a while, as we've discussed, but they will eventually think, I, I did not know this was happening and I cannot endorse this anymore. So I'm going to give up this, that, the other. Like my mother, for example, she's never eaten duck, she's never eaten venison and she's never eaten rabbit because she thinks those animals are cute. Yeah. But she'll eat chicken. She gave up red meat quite a while ago because she had high blood pressure. She'll eat chicken and she eats a little bit of fish and she drinks milk and eggs, right? But she justifies the fact that, well, they're not cute. Yeah. <laughs> Which is an easy argument to it's, extrapolate it's, out to a human being. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're not cute enough for me. Kill them, bash them. Not, not cute. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So there are some animals that, even though they're eaten by, by some people, they're they're like they've got this unusual position that they're not just a food stuff they're also something that's cute mm. and something that you could possibly you know keep as a pet like a duck you know what we could bank on um is that from from my experience now you know four years out on the streets so uh, the majority of people are morally against it yeah yeah but yeah. they're in their practice they it's not convenient enough they don't know what to do just yet yeah. they're, they're not willing to put that energy into changing but they're morally against it yeah yeah so if we've got enough people who are morally against it then we can get the vote to get these things outlawed so if if we like let's let's just say like don't be disheartened if you don't turn someone vegan if they're morally against it because mm. at least we've got them on our side even if yeah, they're yeah. still consuming the products yeah yeah that that I would consider people like my mother who understands. She understands what she's doing is, is illogical. Mm. But I consider her not quite an ally, but somebody who I can talk to. And I think, I think she's resistant mm. because it's me. But I think if she heard arguments from someone else, someone else and those arguments repeated... I think she'd go vegan. Uh, wait, um, wait, wait, one second, one second. Because I bring this up in my... This is the main question I always get. Sorry to interrupt you, but this is yeah, really important. Fine. When you said if it was someone else... Now, when people go, Joey, my friends and my family, they won't listen to me. And yeah. I say there's some psychological barrier because, there is. You, you know, they've always known you. You've, you haven't been right the whole time. What is this psychological barrier between you and close friends or you and parents or family members that makes it so much harder... For them to listen to you it's either really easy mm. or impossible i i can only speculate but what i would imagine it's because it's even more in your face okay when it's someone that you live with or you love and you you spend a lot of time with it's absolutely in your face and it's not just in your face one time in the street it's in your face all the time so i think people can put up a consistent level of resistance okay. to that. And it's easy to say to somebody who you know very well, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to do it, and and feel some level of justification for saying okay. that. Like, for example, I've, I've got a son who's 22. He's uh, 
away, been away at university and doing his master's degree now. And when I went vegan at the beginning of 2016, he ate meat and he laughed. You know, he used to laugh at me for being vegetarian. And he was like, oh my God, you've gone vegan. Oh my God. He went away to university because he didn't live with me um, anyway, but um, he went away to university, came back after his first semester for Christmas and he went, oh, by the way, I've gone vegan. And it wasn't my argument. I think maybe... You planted a seed? I planted a seed. Okay. And he went away to university, met lots of people, joined a vegan society, learned all about it in his own time, in his own space, uh-huh. with his own peer group. Yeah. So instead of just listening to his mum preaching at him, yeah. he actually heard all of the arguments that he'd heard me say yeah. by his own peer group. Yep. And that's why activism should come in all shapes and sizes and all forms. Yeah. Because what type of person will reach bill won't reach martha yeah you you sometimes need somebody who is separate more, more like them and separate and separate that they choose to associate with yeah who they feel th- understands them maybe because yeah. like me going over to india and trying to advocate to that culture they're gonna be like who are you exactly what are you doing here exactly <laughs> you know, so, but i'm not for going over to there like that's not for me i'm, I'm yeah. I, I have to like it, it wouldn't re- maybe an indian activist could resonate with his own people more. exactly um you know this a certain gender might resonate with another gender like yeah. a, a certain political ideology a certain you know but people resonate with who they're going to resonate with like yeah. you, sh- you don't have to be the activist that tries to resonate with everyone no even though i try to be as broad as possible you just can't reach it. there's always going to be a group of people that aren't don't yeah. like you. Don't don't appreciate yeah, what yeah. you said. It's, you're, you're putting you're pushing me away. You're pushing me away. Um, yeah. But that's interesting. Uh, my friend Omri Paz from Vegan Friendly in Israel calls it the hundred points effect. <laughs> so it's like, oh, you know, you might have been that twenty points to get him started, and when, yeah. then he hears another comment or you know piece of information that might be fifteen points. Sees something in his Facebook feed. It's you know. It's, baby male chicks being ground up alive for the egg industry yeah. that's 25 points and when he reaches this 100 points he becomes full vegan maybe yeah that's it's, it's a good good way to look at it because again it's it's about the impetus of a social movement mm. and that impetus has started so anybody who you know has had that seed planted and who is maybe a little bit in denial still but willing to hold it there mm. it's there gnawing away at them easy to push it back for now but it's gnawing away at them like when i was consuming dairy for years yeah. right it was there i could push it right to the back of my mind it came back occasionally and gnawed at me a little bit and i pushed it back and that one thing so maybe i i already had maybe 70 points maybe yeah you know um that that i was that i was holding back you and see then, that one conversation and then like, that, I've been waiting for this for years. <laughs> and, and it could be. And I think if that conversation had happened 10 years previous, I think that would have been the point where I would have... Oh, really? Vegan. I think so, yeah. I wow. mean, it's, 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 well, it's an anecdote. Um, and it's just wow. me. But that, but, but that makes... So when people say, oh, you know, you shouldn't be talking about this, keep your mouth closed about no. it, just lead by example. You could be missing a potential Michelle exactly. from going vegan just from having a conversation, polite exactly. discussion about it. Exactly. And and that's why we should never miss opportunities mm-hmm. to, to advocate. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you feel that, you know, you've said it a million times to a million different people and you've had absolutely no effect. So what I said before, don't be despondent because you don't know what effect you're You can't you're measure having. your effect. Exactly. You don't know whether that person is going to go away and have that light bulb moment. Mm. You don't know whether that person is going to go away and start searching on social media for information. Mm-hmm. And a year down the line, actually, the final thing falls into place and they do it. They go vegan. So really, it's activism, as I said, should come in all shapes and sizes, lots of different arguments and use the arguments that you've that fit best with you, that feel the best for you. But the but but, you know, practice arguments, if you if you're a brand new vegan, Right. You know, you might not be ready yet to go out and advocate for animals, or at least you think that. But actually, say what it's like for you Mm -hmm. as a new vegan. Get people talking about 
what it's like as a new vegan having to look at packets and yeah. and and learning about stuff and That's is it idea, is yeah. it fun is it is it a pain is it easy what apps are you using yeah those conversations you know make videos about it put it on facebook yeah tweet out that you've found this product that product the other product it's tiny it takes seconds and it doesn't feel like you're doing anything at all but you are yeah because you don't know when a Michelle will come along mm. who actually was probably ready for that conversation 10 years ago, but <sighs> nobody had that conversation with me. So I, I was never, never needed to be uncomfortable. Uh -huh. I never needed to have that little nugget actually come right to the front of wow. me saying, no, I, <laughs> I can't do this anymore, I've got, I've got to do it. And like my son, you know, that it took him going away to university to make his own mind up in his own space so all of those people, whoever they are, his friends, whatever it was, they were the final straw. Wow. I was just a, a tiny part of the sea planter. They actually made the difference. Amazing. Yeah. So that, That's a very powerful message for anyone out there. Yeah. like, I see Earthling Ed and he's just <clears throat> doing all these things all the time. I can't do that. Every little bit counts. And there's a movement exactly. of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of us millions i'd say across the world yeah every little conversation counts and it does yeah and every little conversation you don't know whether your little conversations that you have with people have actually converted or at least sowed a seed or have been the final little straw that was needed for the next activist <laughs> for, for the next you know you might have done that for more people in a month than earthling edison yeah you don't know, don't know. Yeah. because we can't we can't track that progress yeah so what we can do is know what we're doing is right, yep. know what we're doing is the right thing to do for the planet, for the animals, for everything, mm -hmm. and stick to the message. Amazing, amazing. Great way to finish. Now, how can everyone find you and your channel? I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Michelle Lowe mm -hmm. on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Just Michelle Lowe, that's my name. Um, I'm Dr. MSH Lowe on Instagram and Twitter. Okay. And I will be very, very happy if you come along and say hello. Wow. So everyone go check out Michelle's channel. And what's what have you got forecast? This strategy, is it going to come further into fruition as you go? Or are you just getting started? Uh, what's to come? I mean, essentially, I make a video every single day. Um, 365, baby. That's one of my little strap lines. That's great. Um, uh, so it's consistency. Yeah. So what you'll see from me is a consistent message every single day. So sometimes it's going to be little bit silly and you know, like like that might be a taste test or a cooking video yep. the next day might be something about psychology the next day might be a call out video cool. but it's it's all adding up so the strategy that i have is consistency and um i'm in it for the long haul so i don't care how many people i've got to call out i'm i'm brazen in a way I'll, I'll go and i'll go on anybody's channel i'll go and call them out to the face i'll go and call them out in any way that I need to, mm. because I am utterly committed to taking that message forward, not just to grow my channel, to get to get AdSense money. I, I started vegan YouTube to make a difference. Well. And that's exactly what I'm, I'm going to do that. Wow, sounds like you've got a very thick skin so you can handle yeah, the, yeah. the trolls in the comments section and so inspiring. I'm looking forward to things to come. And thank you so much for coming on the Carb Strong cast. You are very welcome. Thanks for having me. Woohoo! <laughs>